Welcome. All right, Mr. Wheatland is a civil rights attorney and employment discrimination lawyer from Richmond. He's the award-winning mystery author and playwright. He has become perhaps Virginia's top screenwriter, and he is in our midst, and he is Caroline's dad. <laughs> we are so happy that he is here with us. He has won 12 national, actually 13 now, if we're still counting, and national and international film awards, including the Virginia Film Festival Award twice, the New York Screenplay Contest, the Hollywood Screenplay Contest, the American Screenplay Contest competition, also the 2013 winner of the Writers Guild of America Drama Award. I should have practiced this list more because it's getting longer and longer. His script, The Last Waltz of Vienna, was named Best Script of Europe in the European Independent Film Festival in Paris, which of course you went to Paris to receive. No, yes. didn't quite. <laughs> Shut this next time. And more amazingly, he won the best drama award at the prestigious Austin Film Festival, the top screenplay from out of 8,200 sub submitted scripts. He's currently working on a nonfiction crime novel as well as a time travel screenplay based on Einstein's deathbed recovery. Discovery. Discovery, yes, discovery. <laughs> Thank you. Deathbed discovery. Thank you. All right. Before I have to be corrected too many more times, I'm going to turn this over to him. Let's welcome Brian for being here, and he's got a wonderful presentation for you. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, Last week I was in California and I told some friends there that I was invited to speak at Brown and they were very impressed. So I just want to let you know that your reputation is preceding you. Uh, I, I gave this address last year and uh, I, I, I looked on YouTube because it was on YouTube last year and I saw that there were 51 people who viewed it. So I thought I can't do the same thing again this year because those 51 people may be looking in. They, they could be all Hollywood directors, so I don't know. So I, I've decided to do it completely new. Uh, uh, this, was, this was my screen last year. I'm gonna do a completely new one this year in the Hollywood tradition. It's now <laughs> Wacky World of Screenwriting 2. Um, I, as, as Dr. Plaskin said, I'm an attorney and I'm a screenwriter. Uh, so I had a choice today whether I was going to talk about consumer finance, truth and lending, and, uh, and commercial uh, 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 law, the new, new trends in commercial law. But then I realized that college students probably on Friday afternoon would not be interested in those sort of topics. So I, I'm, we're going to talk about movies today. And uh, we're all excited about movies. We just had a film festival here. Over 100 movies played here in Charlottesville. How many of you had a chance to see any of those movies? Terrific. Uh, did you see some of the new releases? Actually, there, these, some of these movies came out before they were actually released. Um, and we're going to talk about some of that and why that, why that is. But uh, uh, let me start off. This is, this is not a very good uh, slide, but uh, give you some background about Hollywood and the movie industry. It used to be that uh, Hollywood movies came primarily from uh, big... Uh, uh, movie uh, companies like uh, Paramount, MGM, uh, Warner Brothers, these studios. Uh, the, the trend has changed now. Uh, studios are not doing these big movies anymore. In fact, they're not doing much of anything other than distribution. Uh, nowadays, independent uh, filmmakers are carrying the ball. And, uh, and this is probably why. Um, as, as many, how many of you have our subscribers to Netflix or Hulu or Amazon. Uh, this is where the action is these days. If you're talking about content, if you're talking about things to write or, and, your, and, and the outlets you want, uh, these are the outlets that are they're actually buying things these days from independent uh, writers. Uh, so people like me have a difficult time with the major studios, but this is an avenue that's really growing right now. There's a real demand for content. And then, of course, you also have uh, cable. Uh, A&E, for example, is, 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 is buying a lot of things. Uh, what else is on here that's, uh, that's doing well? Um, USA um, and some of the others are also, also buying content. Now, uh, 
one of the things I'm supposed to do here is, is to sort of give you some encouragement as you go forward in your career. Uh, and let me, let me tell you, uh, uh, Dr. Plaskin said I, I should be giving you some advice uh, during this talk, and he didn't say it had to be good advice, but I'm, I'm going to give you advice anyway. And the advice I have is that no matter uh, what field uh, you want to go into, uh, whether it's science or, or uh, accounting or, 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 or something like that, there's still inside of you a story. There's still, there's still inside of you an expression that you want to get out. And I'm encouraging it encouraging you at this point, no matter what you go into, don't avoid getting your story out somehow, whether you're going to write poetry, whether you're going to write a screenplay, a novel, short stories, something, get that message out. Uh, and you guys are, are really have the creativity at this point in your lives to do this. Uh, you have what they call a voice that uh, Hollywood and other uh, producers like to hear because it's a young voice. Um, let me keep going here a second. Uh, let me just play a clip. And how many of you know this movie? Okay, this is how you feel after you turn in that midterm test. Uh, but uh, <laughs> this is one of the top, uh, top grossing movies of 2013. And I, I play that for you because it seems like when you're watching a movie like this, it's all action. It's all very organic, what's happening on the screen. But nonetheless, there's someone like me who actually put this down in writing. Every movie starts with a script unless it's paranormal activity. Every movie starts with a script. And there's someone who has to come up with the idea and, and, and somehow translate that vision that they have onto the page. And here's a page from what we just saw. And it looks like nothing like we just saw because it's just words on paper. Um, but um, there's a lot of creativity in these words. A primal scream of God-forsaken fear erupts from her lungs. Uh, as you're sitting there watching the movie, you don't, you don't hear that poetic type of, of language, but you see it on the screen. Now, Gravity won, won a, a few Academy Awards. Uh, there's, there's a, uh, the Oscars are coming up in February. Does anybody in this room have any idea of the nine films that are the leading contenders for the Oscar next year. And here we are in no November. Does anybody have any ideas? Is the theory of everything a monster? Theory of everything? Theory of everything? Okay. Yes. Imitation game is probably on there. Imitation game, good. Wild. Wild? You guys are very good. <laughs> Fox catcher. <laughs> you've, you've, have you seen these movies? In yeah. the film festival? Okay, all right. Because if I went to some other place in the United States, they'd probably have no idea what these movies are. Anything else? Well, let me give you the list of, of this is the, the current, I mean, there are some, some websites that give you like the current leading contenders for the Oscars. And these are the ones that are up now. Uh, and, and, and you might say, well, I, I, I haven't heard half of these movies. And the reason is because according to the Academy Awards, uh, the rules are that the movie has to be uh, shown in two markets, uh, Los Angeles County and Manhattan, for a certain period of time before the end of the year. So what, what these 
producers and directors do. They wait till December or late November to do this, and then they try to generate the buzz so that their movie is hot by February when the, the awards come out. So uh, right now, Boyhood has been out for a couple of months. Foxcatcher, I don't think that's actually been released yet. I think we saw, uh, when we went to the movies here, we saw that. And uh, they had uh, Navy SEALs in the audience with uh, night vision goggles or something to make sure nobody was, was recording it. Uh, Grand Budapest Hotel has been out, actually, that's been out for a while. It's been out, I think, since March or April. Mm -hmm. Mr. Turner, I think that played at the festival, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but that hasn't been released yet. Leviathan has not come out. Imitation Game has not come out. Theory of Everything, I think, is released a couple days ago. Yeah, it came yeah, out right. very... Uh, Unbroken is uh, Angelina Jolie's movie about the World War II veteran that could not be broken. <laughs> that's coming out in December. And I don't think Whiplash has come out. I don't think Wild is, is one of the contenders. Uh, Whiplash is what I was thinking. But, okay, so you haven't heard of the movies. Has anybody heard of the screenwriters of these movies? Okay. There are actually screenwriters in these movies. You probably haven't heard of any of them. Maybe Wes Anderson, uh, Linklater, is, is, a, is pretty well known, the Coen brothers. Uh, but um, these are the people who are vying for Academy Awards, and you don't know who they are even when they go up there and accept their award in February. Writers are probably the least known and the least appreciated of anybody involved in the process. And that's been true for a long time. Uh, Irving Thalberg was one of the first major producers in Hollywood, and even he believed that writers, he acknowledged they were important, but he just didn't want to pay them. Um, but Irving Thalberg had, wasn't a man of a lot of, uh, uh, well, he made mistakes too. Uh, he didn't take Gone with the Wind, for example, because the Civil War movies don't make much money. Okay, first fun fact. Um, People have seen the artist, remember this dog, Uggy? Uh, and Uggy is here to tell you that there are more stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for animals than there are for writers. So that, that just gives you some idea of writers. Now, um, so, so I guess the bottom line is, you know, writers don't get respect. They don't make a whole lot of money. Why do people do this? Uh, well, let me tell you, I do it because I enjoy, I enjoy writing. Uh, screenplays are, are kind of fun because they're maybe 100 pages long. They're not incredibly long. Uh, there's a structure to them. Once you learn the structure, it's kind of fun to try to put your concepts into the structure. Uh, and there's also the possibility, just the possibility, this teeny tiny possibility that your screenplay will become a film someday and you'll be rich and famous. Uh, People ask me what it's like to be, to be on the edge of stardom. And I tell them it's a, it's a tough place to be. Because any day I could get an email, and I'm still waiting for that email that says that script has been sold or, or, or Steven Spielberg is interested in talking to you or something like that. Um, and that's kind, of, that's kind of what I live day to day for at this point. Uh, it may never come. Uh, there's a vault in a cave in Missouri that houses old scripts, believe it or not. The studios rent this space out underground to put scripts because um, they don't need them anymore and they don't want anybody else to have them. Um, anyway, let's, let's start with the numbers. I say 280 feature films a year. And obviously, there are more than this because independent filmmakers make, make a lot of films. But for the most part, the films that you go to the multiplex and see uh, that are distributed nationally and internationally, about 280 films a year. And for those 280 films, there are 3,000 active screenwriters. Now, these are the people who uh, either make their living or have had some success, have sold some screenplays over the years. They're still working at it. Um, so these are the screenwriters that are trying to get into that 280. And then there are people like me, uh, we'll say another 15,000, that's an estimate. Uh, these are the people that you can find in any Los Angeles uh, Starbucks with their little laptops. And uh, there, I guess right now, probably there are thousands of them right now in LA <coughs> writing their screenplays with the hope and dream that one day they will become one of the 280 movies. So I figure my chances of, of getting a movie made are like 1.5%. Uh, 
But nonetheless, you know, I'm still trying. And, and they say, you know, keep writing, you'll, you'll get better, keep <coughs> making contacts, keep networking. I've got managers in, in Hollywood that are actually pretty good managers that are encouraging me. I'm no longer writing the, 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 the dramas that appeal to me. I'm writing sci-fi, I'm writing horror movies, I'm writing things that are maybe a little more commercial. Uh, so there I am uh, staring at the, uh, the top of Mount Everest. And at some point I figure I'm going to get there if I just work hard enough and I get a couple breaks. But when I get near the top, this is what it looks like. <laughs> there are other people also climbing over me, and it'll be that way, uh, I guess, as long as there are, there are movies. Now you say, how, how did I, what was my path? How did I get to be where I am now on the edge of stardom? <laughs> uh, and that would be through what they call, what, through screenplay contests. There are a number of, there are hundreds of screenplay contests. Virginia has one, for example. Um, but there are some key screenplay contests that I've listed here that if you win or you place highly in, you attract attention of managers and agents and people who might actually open some doors for you. Uh, the, the main one is, is called Nichols, and that's a, affiliated with the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. If you are a Nichols fellow, if you are one of the top five scripts in the Nichols competition, you get a $35,000 fellowship and they will encourage you and help you write your script. Uh, Nichols is very competitive. Uh, Austin Film Festival, which I won last year and I was a finalist this year, had 8,000 scripts or so this year uh, in many different categories. The Page Awards is another. If you place highly in these competitions, uh, your career is going to advance. These were the, the total entries this year. I mean, it's, it's just amazing to me how many scripts are out there and people write and, and contribute to these contests. Now that's not to say that, for example, in Nichols, 7,500 scripts are excellent scripts. Uh, I would venture to say that maybe 10% are written in a foreign language and are thrown away. Another 10% are not formatted properly and, and are not in the, do not appear to be scripts, they're more like novels. Uh, but there are, uh, some very excellent scripts written by people like you, for example, that uh, should be produced and perhaps are not being produced. Uh, I don't, do you, anybody know this guy? Vince Gilligan. Vince Gilligan, Vince Gilligan uh, is from Farmville, Virginia originally. He went to NYU. He is the creator of Breaking Bad. Uh, he won the Virginia Film uh, Screenplay Competition about 15 years ago and was discovered with his script uh, and uh, latched on to a producer and uh, the rest is history. Um, here we are, he was award, he and I both were awarded last year, so that's sort of the Virginia, Virginia view. Um, I just put Joan Rivers in here because just to pay homage to, Virgin, to, to Joan Rivers. There's uh, <laughs> another guy, I don't know if anybody knows this guy, probably not, he's not quite as famous as Vince Gilligan. Uh, he was a lead writer on The Sopranos, and he was the creator of Mad Men. His name is Matthew Weiner. Um, he's a great guy. And uh, Vince Gilligan and Weiner uh, both started in uh, movies, both started writing screenplays. And what happened is they realized, and, and maybe someday I will also realize, that if you want to advance in this career, you better go to television. Um, and that's what they did. They had uh, pilots. Uh, it's interesting that uh, in uh, Weiner's case, uh, he wrote Mad Men's pilot back three or four years before The Sopranos started. And it just sat there. Uh, once The Sopranos got really big, uh, other TV producers started looking at their writers. What else do you have? And he said, well, I have this Mad Men script. And it was, uh, I don't know if, you, if you've seen Mad Men. It's, it's, a, it's an acquired taste, I think. Uh, it's a period piece set in the 1960s about Madison Avenue and advertising. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, because he had that, that cred from The Sopranos, he was able to get his own series. Um, this is really true. All it takes uh, to be successful screenwriters to sell one script. Uh, and we'll talk about later on how much 
the screener can actually make if he sells, if he sells the script. This is, this is mine. Uh, this, this was the script that, that won most of the competitions that I entered. Um, and it's a story that I found quite accidentally um, when I was uh, in the public library. I pulled out a book about uh, uh, Sigmund Freud's right-hand man. His name was Ernest Jones. And there was a line in that book that talked about how Freud escaped from Nazi Austria in 1938. And his escape was facilitated by uh, a Nazi sympathizer. He was a chemist who helped Freud escape. And so I went back to the computer and I was looking up, any, anybody write anything about this, any movies about this? Nothing. Uh, so I thought, hey, it's a great, a great idea. So uh, anyway, I wrote that. And uh, that's, that script right now is, uh, is being considered by a couple producers. Uh, one is the Weinstein Company. Uh, which uh, did the imitation game. Uh, Foxcatcher? I'm not sure if they did Foxcatcher or not. Uh, I put Marilyn Monroe in here, not so much for the quote, but for the fact that she's sitting on a couch, apparently reading a script. Now, uh, how does one get their script uh, actually made? And it's, 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 it's like the stars all have to come together before a movie is actually made. And the key, uh, one of the key stars is to find talent, to find an actor who read your script and loves it. If Le Leonardo DiCaprio read my script and loved it, I'm gold, I'm done. I mean, that's it. Uh, so uh, there are some, some actors who are star quality, and there aren't that many that actually today can carry a drama, can bring people to the movie theater. Uh, DiCaprio is one. Uh, Tom Hanks, uh, Meryl Streep, um, Sandra Bullock. Um, I'm sure there are a couple others, maybe Channing Tatum. I'm not sure he's that, he's that much yet. Um, uh, Matthew Broderick. Um, you get somebody like that signed on, I think, uh, I think your movie's going to be getting made. Now, what's the problem with Hollywood? Well, the problem with Hollywood is uh, basically the people who go pay money for movies are satisfied with stuff like this. Uh, and they, they keep coming up. These are actually films that are in production. And, and like eight X-Men, do we need eight X-Men movies? Do we need 24 James Bond movies? Um, and some of these, you know, you look at them and you say, they're actually making a, the fourth movie, The Expendables. I mean, Expendable 2's lost money. I mean, how far are they going to go before they realize <laughs> that maybe that's not a good thing to do? Um, but as long as people go and pay money, Planet of the Apes, for example, you go see Planet of the Apes, someone in Hollywood is saying, well, they put that last person paid money to go see Planet of the Apes. That just pushed us over the line. Now we're going to do Planet of the Apes 3. That's, that's, actually, I think that actually is in production, Planet of the Apes 3. Maybe they'll push it 4 and 5. But you say to yourself, why do they do this? Uh, and the, the answer I'm going, I'm going to show you is that it's not you guys, it's the world. At, at, at this point, uh, Hollywood is not necessarily trying to appeal to the Cavaliers. Uh, they're trying to appeal to the Chinese, the Japanese, uh, India, uh, the emerging markets where um, they will turn out in droves to see these movies. And you see, the, the trend now is the, the, the domestic market is pretty much leveled off at 10 to 11 percent of the, of the uh, uh, I'm sorry, 10 to 11 billion per year. The emerging markets are accounting for more and more, uh, maybe like two and a half times as much as the American markets. And this is where the money is coming in uh, to Hollywood. Now, let me give you an example. A friend of mine said, uh, told me to stop writing dramas uh, because they're not going to be uh, commercially uh, accepted in these, uh, around the world because there's just too much dialogue. He said that, well, we should write our, our movies that, where one guy is chasing another guy with a gun or with a laser or something because you don't need subtitles on that. 
Uh, everybody can realize that there's, there's uh, action going on. So a lot of the movies are going to be action. This is a, a movie that's actually going to be out in 2016. So if, if unfortunately you're met with a terrible calamity, please go on life support for another year and wait till the sinister six <laughs> uh, because it is it's going to be a, a blockbuster. And, and I'm going to ask if anyone knows six of mankind's greatest enemies joined together to destroy New York City and anybody know? What's that? No, they're going to destroy something else. Something else. And this is what's going to this, this, this is what's going to drive <laughs> this is going to this is going to drive the Chinese and the Japanese and the Indians to the movie theaters. They're going to destroy New York City and Spider-Man, of course. You put Spider-Man in a movie, you get an extra five billion dollars. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what you, you what are you all paying for movies. You you probably see movies on on uh, on grounds, right? You don't go into town and see movies. Probably not. Uh, that's the going rate right now in Richmond. So. This is kind of a breakdown of where the, where the uh, uh, most profits are coming from. Uh, and and this, is, this is two years old now. I'm sure it's even, even higher now. Uh, China leading the way, of course, Japan. Uh, and let me give you an example. Uh, Godzilla. Did anybody see Godzilla? You did see Godzilla. Okay, shame on you guys for going to see Godzilla. <laughs> you are, uh, I, okay, so Godzilla was made with, uh, that's what it cost to make Godzilla, $160 million. And you think, well, that's a, that's a pretty high gamble to take to make Godzilla, because are we ever going to get our money back? Well, not in the United States. Uh, well, actually, yeah. Some, they, they did get a return. I'm sorry. I'm thinking something else. They did get uh, $200 million back in the U.S. box office. So the return on investment is 31%. So, being the, the doctor of PowerPoint I am, I just sort of put Godzilla at 31% there. <laughs> so, uh, so what happened nationally or internationally? Godzilla. <laughs> $307 $407 foreign box office. So now the return is 217%. And, and guess what country led the way? Uh, Japan. 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 <laughs> Japan led the way. And the, the, the filmmakers targeted Japan because they made two different Godzilla movies. They made an English version and a Japanese version. And I, I'm not sure if it's exactly half, but about half of the actors in the movie were Japanese. So they were able to, to, to do it. And, and, uh, so, and, and they won. Now, 217%, if you're an investor, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's not as good as other ones. And I'll, I'll show you one. The Conjuring. Anybody see The Conjuring? It's a little, a, little, a little horror movie. It was okay. It was an okay movie. But it, the budget was only $20 million. Worldwide, they made $271 million. So that your return on investment is 1,256%. That's good, but it's not the best one. Annabelle, 6.7 million budget, box office 155, 2200% return on investment. Uh, there are a lot of independent filmmakers out here trying to do an Annabelle. Uh, and so you're going to probably see horror movies coming up, uh, maybe even more than the superhero movies in the next few years because the return is just so great. Okay, let's talk about a the screenplay. I, I brought one for you. Isn't this exciting? Here's the screenplay. Uh, and basically, it's about 100 pages long. Um, three hole punches on it. You put Brad's in the top one and the bottom hole. And why don't you put one in the middle hole? Anybody have any, any clue? It's a trick question. Well, you don't put a Brad in the middle hole because if you do, they know you're an amateur. Okay? <laughs> so it's like an inside thing. You, you, you put Brad's in the top and the bottom, and you don't put anything out, you don't put a title sheet on the, on the front. It's another trick. If you put your name on the front, they know you're an amateur, and you don't want them to know you're an amateur. Also, when you put 
a blank sheet on the front that, that allows them to write things on the front of your script. And things like reject it. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter at all, really. <laughs> okay, here. And also, uh, it's amazing in, in this day and age that scripts are still printed out. They still want hard copy because the actors like to have the feel of the script. Now, I guess that's not, you know, that's nothing wrong with that. It's just that there's just so much paper wasted in printing these things out. Here's Walter White uh, reading one of the Breaking Bad scripts. Uh, now, uh, I'm just going to show this to you because this is, this is unreal. <laughs> this, this is my manager's office, uh, if you can believe it. This is, this is in uh, uh, Hollywood. And they actually solicit scripts online. And if you want to try to get representation, uh, and it happens every once in a while. Uh, I can remember the, the, uh, the movie Prisoners. Um, that was one of these scripts. Um, a guy who was a waiter in New York City wrote it, sent it into the management company. For some reason, somebody read it, liked it. They attached some talent to it. Hugh Jackman uh, signed on to it. Uh, but this, I mean, I don't know whether to be inspired by this or, or not. <laughs> but this is, I, I actually saw this in person. This is, a, this is an amazing thing. Um, so anyway, this gives you some idea of, of what you're up against. And if your script is on the bottom there, you, you know you're probably not going to get very far. Everybody writes scripts. Uh, even President Roosevelt uh, wrote, a, wrote a screenplay on uh, John Paul Jones. Uh, never produced. Uh, it's, in the, it's in the vault in Missouri right now. And that's, that's the truth. That's where it is. Uh, let's talk about uh, what, what is in a screenplay. Uh, the, the chemical combination that we have to put together to make a screenplay. Uh, has anyone, I, out of curiosity, has anybody uh, written a screenplay here or tried to? Uh, there's a, there, there's software you can buy that makes it very easy to do. Um, and, and you could probably put together a screenplay uh, if you sat down and, and, and put maybe two hours a day into it, you could probably have one done maybe in 45 days. Um, the key is to have a good rewrite because uh, the first draft is usually horrible. But there are certain elements of a screenplay that you've got to put in there, like the cover page. And this is the actual cover page of, of Django Unchanged, Unchained. Uh, and Quentin Tarantino is an Academy Award winning uh, screenwriter. So he can get away, and he's also the producer, director, and everything. So he can get away with stuff like this. But, but generally, you should, you should probably use a, a good typeface and, and make it nice and clean. Um, <laughs> And, and what, what is the structure of a screenplay? Well, a screenplay is no different than uh, the classic three-act play, the structure of a, a good novel. And uh, I'm sure you've learned this in uh, high school, the three-act play, where you have uh, the opening, then the action act, and then the resolution. And the same, the same is true with screenplays. It's the hero's journey. Uh, how, uh, how does the pr protagonist uh, who has this flaw, overcome his flaw, and eventually succeed. Uh, now I'm going to play Look at you. A, a commercial. So dashing. Come on. Nowadays, lots of people go by themselves. No, they don't. Hey, Sonny. Who's Okay, now, why did I play that? What, what was about that commercial? Did you, did you know structure in that commercial? 
is a three acts in that commercial. <coughs> okay, and, and that's, that's, the classic, uh, that's the classic structure. And, and it's in music videos, commercials, uh, anything basically uh, short stories. Uh, you see where they, they set it up. Uh, you, you get to know who the protagonist is immediately. There's an inciting incident. The inciting incident in, in this case, well, okay, the flaw, let me go back. The flaw is the guy doesn't have a date for the prom. So he has to overcome that flaw. The inciting incident is when the dad throws the keys. All of a sudden, he's now ready to move into his journey, which is act two. He gets in the car and he drives. Uh, there are certain fun things that happen in his drive. He sees the girls and he parks in the principals and everything. And then uh, the resolution is, okay, he's at the prom, he kisses the girl of his dreams, uh, he suffers a, a repercu repercussions from that, but there's a redemption at the end where he actually is hooting and hollering that, he's, that he, he, he set out to, to accomplish what he did. Uh, so anyway, that, that, did anybody understand that? Now, that? That happened in like 30 seconds, all of that. And, and that happens in movies. We went to, uh, went to see a movie called if I stay. Did anybody see that movie? You saw the movie, If I Stay? Okay, it's a cute, it's a cute movie. And it's a story about uh, this, this, uh, this girl basically who gets in a car accident and is her, her, her ghostly self. And she's looking back on her family and all this and her boyfriend and all this stuff. Well, when you... I was sitting at the movie and I was looking at my watch and I, I, I looked at the watch and it was like 15, 15 minutes into the movie and I said, the inciting incident is going to happen any second. And, and what happened was they rounded the corner and sure enough they had a head-on accident and that was the inciting incident that propelled them in to, uh, to act two. So next time you're at a movie, look at your watch 15 minutes in, something's going to happen. It happens all the time. And th this is the formula that Hollywood likes. I'm going to show you another if I, can, if I can make this work. I'm going to show you another one. Oh, that's so wait a second. Look at no, that's so dashing. Okay. Let's see if I can do this. Really? It's not worth it. No worries. I got this. What's the inciting incident here? There he goes. The scarf goes. He's on his journey now. He's falling down. And the protagonist is doing things to help himself. He's being active here. Act three now. And act three usually ends with a very warm romantic ending. Introducing Droid Turbo by Motorola. Okay, so another three act, and that was in 30 seconds. Did everybody kind of get the feel of that? So when you're watching commercials, don't just like eat. Try to figure out try to figure out what they're trying to do to you. And, that, and that's how you tell a story. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. So I, anyway, this is, this is a basic uh, three-act structure you'll see in practically every movie. The inciting incident that, that, that propels them into act two. The act two is the journey. And then the climax and uh, the fact. And then at the end, of course, he's in the arms of his, his loved one. And every movie, you can do this. You can plot it out. Jaws, for example, like you can plot out. These, these key points in Jaws. Now, even jokes have three-act structure. Uh, I'm not being political here, but th this guy could really tell a joke. So I want you to try to figure out the three, three acts in this joke. Out driving on a back road on his way to look at some property and suddenly noticed down beside him was a chicken keeping pace with him and he was doing 60 miles an hour. And suddenly the chicken spurted out ahead of him. And it looked to him as if the chicken had three legs. And then it turned and went down the sign road and into a barnyard. And the driver turned down that lane, drove into the barnyard. There was a farmer there. And he asked him, he said, did you see a chicken go by here? And the 
And the farmer said, yep. He says, do they have three legs? And the farmer says, yep. I raise them that way. I breed them. He says, you do? He said, I'll, I'll come. Well, he said, I just love the drumstick. I'm always like the drumstick. And now Junior's come along. And he likes it. And we just got tired of fighting over it. So I've been breeding three-legged chickens. And the tribe said, well, how do they taste? He says, I don't know. I haven't been able to catch one yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but anyway, that even that joke had had three acts to it. The journey of following the chicken would be the second act. Um, beyond structure, you need characters, and this is this is the downfall of many screenwriters. You have to invent characters that people like, or or maybe not like, um, and the character has to have an arc. I'm going to try to rush through this because I know we're getting. Getting close. The character has to have an arc. The character has a flaw. He has to overcome the flaw. Throughout the movie, you'll see this, this arc where the character has to improve. He has to make movement. He has to make motion toward a resolution where he, he overcomes his, his flaw. Here's a good example. The King's Speech. He had a stutter. Uh, he still had a stutter at the end of the movie, but he overcame his, his uh, fear of it. He was able, in fact, they, he, he led England to the victory in World War II by overcoming his stutter. Uh, figure out, uh, you know Sully, you know this movie, Monsters, Inc. Uh, what, what was Sully's character flaw? He was a, okay, he was a, he was a monster. He had no heart, okay? He, he's, he's, he scared children. He, he appeared in their closets and he scared them. Uh, did he overcome this flaw at the end of the movie? Kitty has to go. This is so sad, I tell you. And this is the worst part. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so uh, aren't, aren't these cartoons, they're, they're wonderful, it's these, some of these Disney things. But I mean, great storytelling in them. Um, but again, this, here's a character who is a mean, evil monster who, who this little girl transformed him into be the lovable teddy bear that he was at the end. I'm not sure that's a good transformation or not. But anyway, real quick. So as a, as a screenwriter, this is what you have to do. You have to do all these things. You have to accomplish all these things in your writing. The story arc has to, has to go there. The, every character has to have some sort of arc, and these arcs are falling over each other, and subplots and so forth. Um, if you can do all that, you'll have a good, um, <laughs> good script. Okay, so again, I started off by saying, why would I do this? Why would I hit my head against the wall being so close to stardom and, and doing all this work? Well, if you do succeed, this is, this is what you're looking for. In, in addition to actually selling the script, if you have a good manager and a good lawyer, you can get 1.5% of the proceeds on the back end of the movie. Now, yeah, it may not sound like much, but we talked about some of those million dollar movies earlier on. Let me give you an example here. Suppose you wrote Frozen. Uh, the budget was 150 million. <coughs> Typically, uh, under a standard contract, uh, a writer gets 5% of, well, it's not actually true, but generally 5% of the budget if it's a large, a large movie. So, uh, what would that be? Uh, seven, seven point five million or so. Uh, I, I could be wrong. I don't know. Anyway, this is what it made: total gross, one point three billion dollars. Merchandising, DVD sales, all included in that. Total assets, two point eight billion dollars. The screenwriter, his back end profits, forty two million dollars. Not bad. 
not bad. And you talk about merchandising. Uh, it's, it's everywhere. And I, I, just, I just looked up uh, frozen Halloween costumes this year. They sold 1.2 million frozen Halloween costumes. I don't know how much they went for. Um, and, and that beat out the sexy Ebola nurse costume. <laughs> uh, uh, suppose, suppose you wrote Iron, the Iron Man uh, franchise. Not only do you get, suppose you wrote the first Iron Man movie. You get the first, second, third, fourth, how many? You get 1.5% of all of that. Uh, so in this case, the screenwriters take $39 million for the first three Iron Man franchises. Now, there, there, were, there are multiple screenwriters here, but if there was only one, that's, that's what he would get. Uh, okay, now you say that's pretty good, um, getting 1.5% of the back end. But remember, the most creative people in Hollywood are the accountants. Uh, this, was an, this is an actual balance sheet from a movie that was, that was made in 2007. I've blacked out the name of the movie and the studio because I'm still trying to, you know, Hollywood's a small town. I don't want to offend anybody. Uh, <laughs> but this is a movie that actually uh, made, the box office was $904 million worldwide. $904 million. When the accountants were done, it had a loss of 167 million. Uh, so the screenwriters take 1.5% of a loss is actually zero. Um, so that's, that's another thing. That's another reason why you get your money up front because there are, there are accountants who wave their Harry Potter magic wand over things and end up with, with zero. Did I say Harry Potter? Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm going to leave you with this. This is, this is a movie that, that played in the, in the uh, Virginia Film Festival. Uh, Dead Poet Society, have you seen this movie? You all should see this movie. And, and the message here is that, that, that no matter what endeavor you get into, and this is basically my, my talk today, whatever endeavor you get into, make sure you follow your dream and you express yourself. I think that's great. I think that's so powerful. So anyway, uh, thank you, and I hope you come back next year for the <laughs> next episode. <laughs> 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 oh, thank you. Louis, please stand up. You know, we've been giving him a round of applause. Uh, Caroline's <laughs> mom is here. Uh, you have put up with a lot, I can see. Yes. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> thank you so much.